several different uh, elements like wild rivers, wild coast, wild forest, and wild islands. We are also dedicated to the education of the next generations with a focus on, on, on wilderness and wild land in Europe. Okay. Now we Send, we share with you a short few minutes uh, video, which is going to explain and present European Wilderness Society and the mission of the European Wilderness Society. Good. Central Europe. The long bridge is an old part of the state of the continent, which is today the continent of the continent of the continent of the continent Okay, so let's uh, quickly follow up. Uh, today I will be kind of the main speaker on this webinar and guiding you through the uh, wilderness network in the northern part of Europe. Um, as you can see on the text, uh, I have the basically forestry and nature resources uh, background. I graduated the forestry university in uh, Slovakia in Zvolen. So I am originally uh, Slovakian. And then uh, in the following more than 30 years, I uh, spent most of my time focusing on the wilderness conservation in Europe. And uh, my, my kind of personal dream was uh, to find as much as possible people, persons, individuals who would like to contribute and cooperate with uh, our team to develop the uh, European Wilderness Network. Um, yeah, I am currently Vice Chairman of European Wilderness Society and I am based in Slovakia in Litovsky Hradok and uh, that's uh, basically my life mission to find, identify and support conservation of the European wilderness. Okay. Wild area definition. Uh, we during, during the year, especially at the early beginning, we learn very quickly lessons that uh, there is uh, still something left in Europe, what we can name as a wilderness, which can fit actually to very strict wilderness definition. But there is also growing number of projects and areas 
which are in the process of spontaneous nature rewilding. And therefore, discussions after, after the long term discussions, the group of the experts decided to divide or create two groups like wild area and wilderness. Wild areas are basically uh, areas with a high level of predominance of natural processes and natural habitats. And, uh, and they tend to be the individually smaller or more fragmented than the wilderness area itself. Also, although they have offered cover extensive tracks, the conditions of these natural habitat processes and relevant species is, however, often partially or substantially modified due to past human activities such as livestock herding, hunting, fishing, collecting the berry or forestry. So that's a basically in activities which has been inter inherited from the previous decades, maybe even the centuries. But in the coming decades, in the coming years, due to the changing political and economical situations, Many of this area has been for various reasons abandoned and suddenly the nature get the free flow of uh, development and uh, some, some miracles starts to happening how f and, and a lot of people was uh, surprised how fast actually this natural spontaneous recovery and rewilding process is going on. Okay. Can we, yeah, so the second second category it's a wilderness itself. So wilderness areas are basically the area which are governed by open-ended, undefined natural processes. This means that we are not able, based on our current knowledge, to predict to say where the mother nature is going to develop in which kind of way is going to develop the, that particular area in the moment when the man hand keep hands off and just leave the land and, and the area on a, its own on a, on a self, self, self uh, development. That's an area which are composed uh, of the native habitats and species and are large enough for the effective ecological functioning of natural processes. This is a very important element of this category of, of, this, of this group of wilderness, the size, because the size many times has a fundamental importance so then can we can see and admire and monitor the natural spontaneous processes these are wilderness are unmodified or only slightly modified and without intrusive or extractive human activity settlements infrastructure or visual disturbances so this sentence is basically underlying necessity that this area are basically outside of any kind of human impact and uh, management uh, influence. Good. This is, uh, I think, already well-known uh, diagram showing in a graphical way what means a wilderness continuum, which is a kind of philosophical background behind the wilderness conservation process, all over process in, in uh, throughout the Europe. As you we can see on the bottom line, that's uh, from the left side to the right side, is basically how wilderness quality is, is growing up from non-wide land, which has been already intensively impacted by the human, uh, human activities. And then and suddenly that the land is abandoned and activities are less and less. The process of either spontaneous rewilding starts up or this rewilding process can be in the specific cases also uh, supported or guided by the purposely planned the activities of the group of people with a clear objective to let mother nature to show us how fast and how far they can recover by itself. However, in a moment when this uh, re spontaneous or man-made rewilding starts in certain process speed up and when it's a necessary or when is a sorry when is a possibly actually to keep hands off completely for example all, all major extinct species has been already reintroduced then we can start to think and uh, invite the area to become the member of european wilderness network that's uh, this black line showing uh, in, in, in uh, area of the medium and high uh, where 
these areas can become uh, the subject of the pre-selection kind of will audit become the either bronze silver gold or platinum uh, certifi certified wilderness areas as a, as a as a tool to show to the public all of the europe and even the globe that this kind of valuable areas we still have inside the europe good so wilderness in this context means uh, a lot of uh, things. Uh, all these uh, rules are basically collected in European wilderness quality standards, which is a living document. As you can see on the right hand side of these slides, this is already recently published last year, the new update of the wilderness quality standard and audit system 2.0, which follows up and combined experience from the more than 20 years of previous work in the field, collecting uh, these experience from the practical work when the auditors visited the area, spent there overnight, several days, sometimes week, in, uh, interviewed uh, a lot of managers, people, park directors, local guys, etc. And then come up with the final suggestions or decisions, recommend recommendations to involve that specific area and invite them to, the, to join the European Wilderness Network. Among others, the one of the most important element of these wilderness quality standards, it's basically to prove that area has currently no human extractions, like no hunting, no logging, no mineral collections, no mining, or even not dead wood connection, collection. That doesn't mean that this area has never happened in this, uh, in this, in the, in this uh, potential wilderness before. We have already a number of examples uh, where the area has been heavily impacted in the previous decades, even centuries. But then since certain moment, all these activities has been either randomly or purposely abandoned. And then uh, that basically opened the door for that specific area to become the, or be invited as a member of European Wilderness Network. Besides the human extractions, another important element of this wilderness quality standard is that the human intervention. So that obviously that means that potential wilderness should be a human intervention free area or zones. That means there are that there is a no disease or alien species control, which is sometimes quite controversial issue and very often discussed during the field work and field audit. And also the area is not subject of any kind of restoration measures currently happening in that area. As I said already a few minutes ago, these pro-wild or pro-wilderness restoration measures usually should happen before the area was uh, applying to become the member of European Wilderness Network. So simply saying wilderness is an open and undefined natural dynamic process. That's another simplify definitions of what, uh, to be honest, quite a quite number of people like much more than that, more technically and longer definitions, what I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Good. So European Wilderness Network, after more than 20 years of the work, uh, has currently more than 40 members scattered all over the Europe, from Scandinavia down to Mediterranean, from the uh, uh, western coast of, of uh, Portugal up to the almost Ural Mountains at the eastern corner of Europe. It includes uh, almost uh, 350, 360,000 hectares of the audited wilderness, which is, was uh, basically area which fitted, fits to the European Wilderness Quality Standard and Audit System. Uh, the pro this process is quite demanding and stepwise uh, oriented where because uh, basically in every visited area or every area where we are visited we are in certain moments starting discussions how to shift from wilderness management or wil management of the area towards the wilderness stewardship which is actually the process pretty much demanding in some uh, conditions and some situations 
But there are also already several good examples in, the, in our network where the actually managers, after the years of thinking, discussing, collecting experience, find out that this makes sense for them actually to shift from the pure management, which actually motivate or create a understanding that management, something active needs to be done. In the case of wilderness stewardship, first of all, managers are recommended to think at the beginning if it is really necessary to do any kind of active management if it is not against the basic fundamental principle of the spontaneous development of the wilderness area. Another, another element, important element of European Wilderness Network, it's a non-intervention stewardship and obviously network is focusing to cover divers and different habitats all over Europe from marine environment high up to the top of the mountains in Alps or Carpathians or Pyrenees. Good. This is a result of the more uh, quite, quite number of years of uh, ex collecting experience and discussions when actually the wilderness itself as a term has been further on developed and the new categories of uh, land like marine, forests, rivers, wild coast, wild sea has been invented because the uh, team of the people working for European Wilderness Society very quickly realized especially after the field audit and field work, that there are some elements, some habitats, which are quite difficult to include or incorporate in the standard way to the category of wilderness itself. And therefore, this kind of wider rivers, for example, has been developed where the area is usually narrow, long, several hundred meters or maybe kilometers and including only the narrow strip of the protected uh, benches and uh, and small beaches al along the river and similarly with the wild coast or other habitats what we are several years ago already developed and incorporated to the european wilderness network thanks As I mentioned already, there are four categories from bronze, silver, gold to platinum. And there are also candidates and already certified areas. So you will see later on in these labels when we go to these concrete specific, specific areas what we try to uh, visit shortly. So four labels uh, depends very much uh, not only on the size, which used to be the one of a main criterion in the past years, but later on we definitely learned very quickly that there is a full spectrum of the elements or items which needs to be taken into the account before the auditors will make the final decisions and come with the su suggestions to, to, to deliver to the area, either bronze, silver, or maybe even the platinum label. But we still have to say that size is a usually quite, quite important element. However, in the case of Wild Island, the size is basically meaningless and it's not taken into the account as much as, for example, in the terrestrial ecosystem. That, that, that's a just example why this kind of development of the mind of the people and managers and auditors uh, ended up with this uh, conclusion in the past years. Good. So let's go to the part one of, the, of this introduction of the European Wilderness Network. Let's focus on the wilderness around the Baltic Sea. This is a picture, of, by the way, from Panayarvi, we will, but we will stop quickly later on in more detailed discussions. Okay, please, next slide. So this is a map of the area of the Europe, as you will see you know, from part of the uh, Europe, including Scandinavia and a few countries uh, south from Baltic Sea. So therefore we said that this is a third of the wilderness areas around, around the Baltic Sea. Good. Fulufjallet. Fulufjallet has a very, very special place in the European Wilderness Network. It's a, Swedish, uh, it's a wilderness located in, a, in, a, in a Sweden at the border with, a fin, uh, with a Norway. And a specific location of this area is a very much because this was a very first area which actually 
was at the early beginning when the European Union network starts to build up in an, almost 20 years ago, 2002. And that was an area which uh, was also actually the newly created protected area and where the core area was already since the beginning considered as a protected area fitting to the wilderness quality standard as European wilderness society developed and proposed in the following years. The area includes also Swedish highest waterfall. However, this is a hotspot for visitors inside of this area. And that, uh, that waterfall is not included in the wilderness, but besides that, almost 19,000 hectares of land is free of the hunting, which is very specific, actually, situation in Scandinavia. It's free of the grazing, another very specific area, specific uh, subject uh, in a, when we are in a Scandinavia, what we have learned very uh, later on, actually, but the uniqueness of this area actually reasons why this area was proposed at the beginning to create as a new protected or as a new national park in Sweden, later on to, to, to invite the people from European Wilderness Society, including to the Wilderness Network, used to be the high plateau, which was covered by lichens, undamaged by the grazing of the reindeer herding. This is uh, area is located, as I mentioned already, at the border with a, of, with a Norway in the lower in, in the middle part of Sweden. So for Central European people, Carpathian Mountains in the Tatra Mountains at the border of Slovakia and Poland. By the way, I like use this example because I am Slovakian and I like Tatras very much. But if anybody of you would climb peak of the Tatra Mountains and look towards the north you will see just open lowland of the Poland. Hundreds of kilometers stretching north, 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 then Baltic Sea, and then again the lowland, boreal forest of the Sweden. And after several, kilome several hundred kilometers, finally the first small mountains rise up, and that's a Fulufjallet. Mountains which reach high enough to create a tree line. Next slide, please. Uh, we can see on, on the left hand side this kind of habitat, what is in at, a, around the Fulufialet, boreal conifer forest, mostly consists of the pine with a lot of lakes and the small mountains behind uh, with a small tree line. On the right hand side of picture, you can see the highest waterfall in Sweden, which is a very high touristic attraction and a lot of people are coming here to visit. Nevertheless, when you cross the boundary towards, uh, towards uh, Norway, there is another protected area, which since the early beginning used to be the subject of the, our auditors and people working for the wilderness in Europe, as a potential enlargement and creation of the transboundary wilderness uh, between uh, Sweden and Norway. And that process is still somehow going on, but it's much, much slower than it was expected at the beginning for very diverse reasons. Different, uh, for example, different system, how nature conservation is organized in Sweden or in Norway. So anyhow, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, on a Swedish side of the Fulufjallet, that's a big mountains with a lot of grass and lichens, typical habitat of Scandinavian tundra composed of conifer forests, mountain heath, deep gorges, and wild unspoiled rivers, which are running out to the various directions from these mountains. Later on, a few, few, few years after we, uh, we started to cooperate with this area, old Tico was it, uh, export, uh, exp explored in this area, the world largest or oldest, oh, sorry, largest, world oldest tree. And scientists say that it's a more than 9,000 years old pine growing in a tree line of the Fulufjallet. Otherwise, this is an area which provides a very suitable habitat for large carnivores, rare birds like yeah, Siberian pie or girl falcon. You have to understand that all area, wild, uh, wide forested conifer area around is heavily used all around the park, either because of forestry, either because of the uh, hunting or fishing. Nevertheless, 
these uh, almost 19,000 hectares of the land designed as the designated as a wilderness is basically free of any kind of human use. The only exception it's a visitors. Tourists which can go inside, register themselves and give, even go inside and spend a night in a cabins which are spread in, uh, along, along the main tourist trails. Good. This is uh, just a few pictures to illustrate diversity of this area. Big, uh, very colorful, especially in, uh, at the end of the summer, in the autumn, of the lower tundra, rivers, creeks, and long, long lines of the moose, uh, which grows on the forest around. Good. So, next Scandinavian country is Finland. And then uh, a very unique experience. One of very first audited and certified wilderness, marine wilderness. The area is uh, on the southern tip of the Finland in, uh, among the sea and that area with archipelago, which uh, wilderness itself cover 10, more than 10,000 hectares. And that's a very strictly protected zone, which is basically no-go area, even for pe local people, for fishermen, for visitors, because they tried since the beginning to create a very strict, strictly protected reserve. And that was a, one of the reasons why actually managers at the beginning approach, uh, approach a European Organic Society and we start the discussions and negotiate and, and uh, agreement how to design or designate and audit this area to become the member of European Wilderness Network. And that happened after a few years of preparation and audit in the 2007, and that's a year when this area became the member of this network. The area is the part of the large, a larger protected area, which is a biosphere reserve archipelago, and that's a part of the largest archipelago network of the world. It includes thousands of islands, rocky islands, uh, iceless, etc. And it's uh, actually only strictly protected uh, marine size in the whole Baltic. Good. Good. Next, please. Yes. Archipelago wilderness uh, is uh, remote, abandoned land. It's not easy to get there. Even the auditors, when they plan the trip, they spend two, three hours just sitting in a, in a boat, electrical, strong electrical boat, to get to the area and visit and see the area on, on our own eyes. Uh, it's a very unhospitable land. It's a very rough area, which is basically covered only slow vegetation, moose, grass, little bit brushes but very rich on the wildlife. It's an important refuge for decline, balting, ring and seals and gray seals. It's an area where even wild-tailed eagle uh, uh, randomly can, can be found and uh, observe and monitor. And, but the true wilderness, true biodiversity is under the sea surface, which is very busy, not easy to explore but the park management of this area and the wilderness managers are doing and running the long-term systematic research and monitoring even the, under the water of this area. Good. As we can see from these pictures, uh, there is a tree. However, uh, as I told you, wilderness itself does not include the tree forest. It's a only low brushy vegetation. Nevertheless, we included these pictures here to indicate that Archipelago National Park is basically also offering a number of other potential wilderness in this area, which also includes islands which are completely abandoned, isolated, but closer to the, to the, to the uh, land, to the mainland of the Finland. And that means there are wind condition not so brutal than in the outer archipelago where is a strong wind and the trees are not growing on islands. So as you see on the left hand side pictures there are bigger brushes and, and pine forests in an area which has been 
potentially already identified as a potential wilderness area to, to, to move on in this subject and uh, find potential second wilderness area in this, uh, in this uh, protected area. But definitely there is a potential for that. Good. Okay, so let's go farther north, almost 50, 70 kilometers from Arctic Cirque, Aulanka. Aulanka wilderness with a size of almost 13,000 hectares. Again, very specific, very unique place because only after a lot of the discussions, negotiation and service in the Finland, we find and managed to create a, a grazing free zone and that was the main step how they actually fit to the European awareness quality standard. Grazing, what is they because uh, become the very important and very difficult challenging issues because the, the they, they don't graze the sheep or cows in this area obviously they graze the reindeer herding that they do the reindeer herding animals which are originally coming from that area but has been domesticated already for several centuries and they used to intensively graze the area around but then managers keeping in mind that there should be the grazing free area identify this green zone of the park as a grazing free and that was actually the gate to get involved invitations to join European wilderness network and it become the member already since 2002 and it also includes this area, not only wilderness, but also the protected area, the several wide rivers like Awanka wide river or Kitka wide river. Good. Uh, you can also remember maybe from the previous map that the area is very, is actually touching the border with, uh, between the Finland and Russia. And uh, they create actually transboundary protected area. This Aulanka forest is something very unique because these are one of the last fragments in the from especially from the Finnish side of the land which has not been impacted by the previous commercial logging operation. There are many rare plants like a calypso or ladies, a lady slipper and the uniqueness of this area because of vegetation is very much because of very interesting and attractive the geological background which includes a lot of uh, sediment like limestone area uh, which provide a very specific conditions for rare species of uh, flora, fauna, etc. Area is also habitat for moose, reindeer, lynx, wolverine and wolf. Good. This is an example of the wide river meandering wide river of Aulanka, which is partially passing through the uh, audited wilderness, but most of the uh, river is outside the wilderness and therefore we, it was awarded as a specific category as the Aulanka wide river. It's all 16 kilometers long in flow through the spruce, floodland and pine stands. In the summertime, it's, uh, inten it's, it's a used by the local or tour tourists generally for, for rafting and exploring and enjoying this uh, wonderful uh, scenery of, of this part of Finland. Good. Another river, in the, this is in a winter period, it's a Kitka, it's much smaller and that I would say from my point of view is e even much more wider even less people are coming there and uh, it's a very unique, very special place, almost 26 kilometers long and uh, in the summer times provide a very good habitat for rare, rare butterflies. Good. Next slide, please. This is a picture just showing the different habitats of this area, Aulanka wilderness, uh, panoramatic view to the surroundings, small hills, uh, rolling hills, a lot of forest, lakes, rivers, narrow canyons, and also on the uh, left hand side on the bottom, we can see the Aulanka river in the area which was not included directly to the wide river, 
because there are some meadows along the river which are very unique and uh, in, in this part of the northern part of uh, Finland and they used to be in the past uh, used by local people for grazing and haymaking. But all around that forest behind the rocks and the pine forest is uh, already part of the wilderness. Next slide, please. As I mentioned on this map, it is also visible. As I mentioned, Aulanka is bordering with the Panayarvi protected area on the Russian side of the border. That's a line in the middle part of the picture. And the green spots, one, two, three, four, five, these are audited fragments of the wilderness in Panayarvi area, which is one of the largest piece of wilderness in European wilderness network, almost 30,000 hectares. And it became the member in the 2005. And uh, it's actually the very first transboundary wilderness in Europe between Aulanka and uh, Panayarvi. Uh, Aulanka River is uh, flowing from uh, Finland towards the east. And once it crosses the border, Aulanka is renamed to Olanga. And Olanga, it's a really growing and bigger river, and it's really great and wide river, so it was also incorporated or included, invited and audited as a, to the category of wide rivers. Okay. Next, next slide, please. We, we have to remember that we are almost close to the Arctic Circle. So just uh, climbing 100 meters above the lowland, we are already in a tree line. This is a picture of, on the left-hand side, a big mountain plateau with a, lo a lot of smaller lakes and uh, heavy, heavy, heavy land around with a very difficult hiking. There is only very limited number of trails because of distance of the area and also because of the very difficult and demanding access from, from the Russian side. However, the forest, what can be seen there, it's a really, a really wilderness. So after experience and visiting the boreal forest in Panayarvi, a lot of people are starting a little bit complain about the wilderness in Avlanka in general about the forestry in Finland, because once the person has the experience, has a chance to experience a real wild boreal forest in Panayarvi, then it starts to learn what it means. This boreal forest, it's a homeland for all full spectrum of nature carnivores like lynx, bear, wolf, wolverines, but also reindeer, but wide reindeers because in Russian side, there is no reindeer herding like they do in uh, Norway, Sweden, or Finland. So that's a real wide reindeer, which is a very rare species actually in Scandinavia. But besides that, the other herbivores occupy this area are also moose and also golden eagle, hare, lemming, etc. Altogether, there is uh, more than 130 endangered spe plant species in this area, uh, also because of diverse geological background in this area. Good. Next slide, please. This is uh, like in Aulanka Wide River. This is a continuation of the same river with the name Olanga Wide River. It's a al almost more than 35, 36 kilometers long, passing uh, along the Panayarvi National Park and Panaya partially Panayarvi Wilderness. And uh, a picture is actually showing the one of a hot touristic hotspot in this part of the Russia. Uh, Kivakaski Rapids, Kivakaski waterfalls, with the highest unregulated waterfall in this part of Russia in Karelia. And uh, that, because we are getting closer and closer to the sea, this is area also used by the, uh, as a migratory path for the brown trout. Good, next slide, please. Okay, this is a spectrum of view of a series of the picture showing you the landscape and the waterfalls and rapids in the Panayari wilderness. As you see the, especially on the left-hand side pictures, it's, it, it is a large area, wild, 
uh, with uh, no steep rugged mountains, but smooth uh, eroded and glaciated peaks uh, from the previous geological periods, a lot of lakes, and everything turned to the very bright color colors when the first frost comes in the September, beginning of October, and then a long winter came and basically visitors and tourists uh, are very, very rare in this remote part of the Russia. Good. Okay, let's go down south a little bit. Estonia, Soma. In Soma, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the uh, three countries which used, Baltic countries which used to be part of Soviet Union. And there, when uh, wilderness society starts to cooperate with them, there was still a lot of signs of this previous history. And, uh, but on another side, this area, which has been offered by the, our partners in, uh, in this country, really, really astonished uh, auditors and uh, they highly recommend it to include at least part of the protected area as, as a wilderness and invite them to the European Wilderness Network. So the first big, um, Meyer peat bog with a size of more than 11,000 hectares has been recommended by auditors after several days of the field audit and work. And uh, it's turned to be one of the largest peat bog in the country with a lot of wetlands, alluvial forests, and uh, already internationally recognized as a Ramsar site. Okay. Besides this one big area, there are three, four, another ones, uh, smaller ones, and there is uh, still uh, discussions between European Wilderness Society and the management if they would like to join or invite other areas also to enlarge this will Soma wilderness, but that's uh, still in the process and let's see what will be result in the coming years. The Soma wilderness is uh, typical with uh, biodiversity, typical for these kind of habitats, which are peat bogs and the boreal forest, which is actually flooded once or twice a year. And this flooding is so typical and so regularly happening that actually local tour operators, it called like fifth season. So besides the spring, summer, autumn, winter, this is an area with a fifth season, which is a flooding, because that's a very attractive period for visitors who are coming here in this time when they can actually do the canoeing or rafting. And they, what is funny, they can actually use a boat and, and uh, swim on a boat among the forest, among the trees, the area which uh, is temporarily covered by the river, which rise up and take out of the, the banks. The area is homeland for roe deer, elk, boar, beaver, and uh, large carnivores like lynx, wolf, and including the brown bear. Number of species of birds obviously host this wild area and rich flora, including iris, iris glo, gl uh, gladiolum, and sedum, sedum palustre. Okay. So this area is offering a lot of potential for new wilderness, uh, very similar habitats like you ca we can see on the pictures, either boreal forest or wetlands or peat bogs or, or lakes. And the uh, uh, lower picture on the right hand side, that's actually uh, the area what I mentioned where river in the springtime when the snow is melting, it's taken out of the banks and flooded extensive areas of the forest or, or lowland. And uh, this is what the visitors, tourists like, and therefore a number of them are coming there and ex experience the rafting among the trees in the forest. Okay. <clears throat> Teichu, next Baltic country, Latvia, Teichu strict reserve, and part of that, almost four and a half thousand hectares, is a Teichu wilderness invited and accepted, audited as a part of the European Wilderness Network. Member since 2017, similar like in Soma, very similar habitats, peat bogs, forests, wetlands, and also international recognized already in the past as a Ramsar site. Okay. 
This is a biodiversity of this specific area where there are more than 60 protected plants and species. That means a quite a rich flora, important habitats for breeding and migratory birds, especially in the autumn and springtime, including the cranes and geese. The area is not easily accessible for the visitors. First of all, because that's a strictly protected zone. There is only small trails uh, at the edges of the park, of the, of the wilderness with a small uh, watch out towers where people can climb five, seven meters above the ground and get a little bit panoramatic view on a big, big pot, big um, marshland, but uh, still worth it to visit in the, in the middle of this uh, country, okay? There will be, I think, a few more pictures showing you there are some details uh, and box and uh, in the winter time scenery and the picture on the left hand side on the bottom that's actually from the from, from one one watching tower to see the panorama and the size and distance of the area which stretch uh, from horizon to horizon okay chapkali another third baltic country this is a area which has been invited or which has been, which shows the interest and was invited to join the European Wilderness Network already in 2011 and offering 13,000 hectares of huge peat bog at the border with the Bielorussia. That's a, this green area on the right hand side. It's also a Ramsar site also already from the previous years. And uh, that's a really area with a no access for the public only on the left hand side uh, at the left hand side edges of the park there is a nature trail with a watching tower where people can come and admire and see the, this piece of land but inside the area only researchers scientists and border patrol control can have access okay you can see from this picture that biodiversity is very specific and unique because uh, we are moving from the north, from the Scandinavian countries, a little bit down to the south. So there is also area where actually copper kelly, black grouse, hooper, green woodpecker can be found. A lot of orchids and uh, different butterflies. Um, all over to more than 4,000 species of plants and animals can, can grow here. And the habitats are much more diverse than, for, for example, area what we have mentioned in the previous minutes, because this is not only pine forest, but also sand dunes, river valley, grassland, bogs, ferns, mires, and even much drier area because of sandy soils, etc. Due to the size, area is offering excellent habitat for beaver, lynx, and wolf. And uh, on, on the Bielorussia side, Behind the border, there is a potential for enlargement of this wilderness and the potential for, for the transboundary wilderness. However, the discussion with the partners behind the border is not currently not so easy and not so, so, so effective, not productive. Okay. This is a picture showing the different habitats. Again, from the, from, from, from the air picture, you can see the size of this huge peat bog, more than 13,000 hectares, and few details and uh, semi-details of the land and the habitats, what can be found in this, this uh, wilderness. Good. Königsberg Heide. Okay, welcome in Germany. This is a very specific story. This is an area which used to be traditionally for last decades, I believe since the First World War, training military area. If you would search, let's say 20 years ago, for completely damaged and destroyed area because of training of military, Königsburg Heide would be one of them. However, when the Soviet Union collapsed and all these uh, previous military training centers uh, has been cancelled and, and closed down. There was this discussion starts among the biologists and nature conservationists in Germany. What we are going to do with this kind of piece of land, which has been heavily used by the previous military trainings, but now because that's a unique opportunity, let's keep hands off and let's see what mother nature is going to tell us. 
this is would be very shortly one sentence to say everything in one 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 minute and they really did do that they just starts to follow up and observe and see what mother nature is doing in the area which has been completely override by the tanks bombs etc and after 20 years miracle happens the area today hosts wolf number of different species which arrived here to this land the, or, the originally open landscape because most of the forest has been cut or burned or damaged is now forested land with a lot of peat box where beavers came and starts to build up the dams so this is the area which has been after long discussions and uh, internal and external European Union the society decided let's invite them let's use this area as an example and motivation for other wilderness to illustrate and to show the power of the nature and potential of self restoration of the of the nature in the in the central europe so for for more, almost 5000 hectares member of european wilderness network night 2014 it's a previous military training ground now revitalized or renaturalized to become the wilderness. It is more than 15 years of spontaneous natural development. It's a diversity of habitat from the very dry to very wet habitats. Okay, next picture. I mentioned at the beginning the biodiversity. You can see, just have a look. Rich flora fauna, roe red deer, beaver, wild boar, red fox, even wolf, even otter arrive because they find a good habitat. Plenty of rare bird species, hoopies, kingfishers, golden, oriole, and nightjar. Next slide, please. What is interesting, however, to, to see and understand, originally this area used to be no-go zone. Why? Because there are still plenty of bombs and munitions un unblowing, and it's uh, threatening and dangerous for people. Nevertheless, park managers already several years is running the guided tours for people who can come and explore and learn how mother, how fast and how powerful mother nature is restoring the land completely impacted and damaged by the military, tra military trainings. We can see the peat box which has been self recreated. On the right hand side, on the bottom, we can see all the bunker from, from the military period. So that's a really specific, specific area which is illustrating potential of spontaneous nature or rewilding uh, of, the, of the European nature in Central Europe. This process, I, we have to say, is ongoing in several other areas, but uh, this is a very specific because that's the size and because of the commitment of the managers. To, to, to keep hands off and see basically what mother nature can do in this kind of area impacted and damaged by the men. Good. Next one, please. Let's go to the northern tip of Germany. And we are slowly closing down this surge around the Baltic Sea. We are in Germany, 800 hectares, the green area on the map. And uh, this consists of terrestrial 350 and marine environment 450. That's a coastal line, very famous touristic destination, Ruyana region. European wilderness member become um, 2016. And the basic attractions or specific of this area, it's a stunning coastline consisting of the chart cliffs, which becomes also UNESCO World Heritage Beach Forest, uh, which is unique due to area uh, due to the fact that actually the beach forest is growing since the sea, la sea, sea level uh, and along the, the charcoal cliffs. Okay, next slide please. This is the inside picture of the old of the forest beach forest. I wouldn't say that it's an old growth forest but it's a forest which is self rewilded already for several decades on the left hand side picture, we can see that's a picture, or that's a view perspective from the forest towards the, uh, towards the sea coast. And it's a very high diversity habitat, variety or in the term of wetlands and nutrition content, 
It includes inside the, land, inside the wilderness box, streams, the beach forest, coastline strip, and uh, sea habitat as well. That, uh, that's a homeland for lady slippers, orchids, coral roots, etc. Cliffs provides a perfect habitat for a number of nesting uh, birds, including peregrine falcon, host martins, wild-tailed eagle, and uh, obviously the biodiversity is increased all due, to, due to the marine environment, which is also included inside the wilderness. Okay. Illustration. As we can see specifically from the bottom picture, that's a very scenic and very wild thinking, feeling of the area. And uh, so not only biodiversity, but to, because of scenery, that's a very heavily used land, in, especially in the summer and the summer seasons. And the new visitor centers build up on uh, one of these cliffs, what we can see on the, left, on the right hand side on the bottom. It's become the kind of uh, very welcome or very, uh, very nice destinations for number of tourists. Simultaneously, however, managers are trying to find a way, compromise, and reduce the pressure of the visitors, specifically if they have an ambitious to climb these this fragile uh, uh, chalk cliffs, which are very sensitive to the erosions. And that's a kind of very strong challenge for these local managers, the wilderness stewards, to, to, to prevent uh, f uh, damage done by, by the over tourist flow. Okay. Will Island, again, new category. We didn't have, that's a one of the very first wild island we found and, and, and we included as, as, a, as a unique place uh, to, to, to the European Wilderness Network. 160 hectares only, 85 terrestrial, 77 hectares marine environment. It's become member since 2017. And as I said, it is uh, become the first wide island in the network. And uh, for a land, uh, f uh, f uh, island is mostly covered by the old growth beach forest, in the, uh, uh, other habitats are lagoons or sandy beaches. Okay. Just illustrations. We see the couple of hundred years old trees fallen down and spending another 50 years to getting apart and getting rotten. And a picture from the cliff down to the coast of the Baltic Sea. It is a rest, uh, from the biodiversity point of view, this area is an important resting site for migratory birds. It's a nesting site even for wild tailed eagles, water birds, and many other species of the geese and especially attractive place because of fragments of the old beach forest. Okay. Picture showing you different habitats, coastline, in, inside of the forest, edges, cliffs, and the marine, marine uh, salty marshes land along the coast. Good. Next one. Heinich. I think this is the last visited area in the Germany. 1500, almost 1600 hectares, member of 2017, part of the UNESCO World Heritage Beach Forest. Reasons to include them to the European Wilderness Network was a remnants of the fragile, or very rare piece of the old growth forest, beach forest in the middle of Germany. Okay. We can see from these pictures that biodiversity, which is offering these fragments of the old forest, it's, it's really amazing. It includes uh, uh, a lot of dead wood, which is not very common in a commercial forest in the surroundings, which is home for the bats. Uh, area, it's a homeland for even for wild wolf, lynx, wildcat, badger, roe deer, or red deer. Many bird species found a house or home of safe habitat to survive in the middle of Germany. And they can use uh, and occupy this kind of uh, holes, uh, trees and, and the habitats. Next one, please. Picture showing different habitats. 
spring aspect bledu leukoium vernum on the on right hand side on the, on, the, on, the, on the top and then uh, example from interior of the nice uh, fragments of the old grove beach and mixed conifer and uh, mostly sorry more mostly broadleaf forest with a lot of dead wood at the, at the ground etc okay So that was uh, first part of our excursions from uh, uh, along uh, around the Baltic Sea. Uh, we had a chance to present and uh, speak a little bit about the, this part of the European Wilderness Network. This picture just illustrate uh, our field work uh, when uh, contracts, agreements, uh, letter of intents are signed discussions in the field with the park managers, park rangers, uh, and also with the discussion with the visitors, etc. Good. A lot of work with the map in the field, identification of the lichens, etc. So, if you know if you, uh, many of you in uh, attending this kind of webinar, I am sure have a good knowledge about the area, what you love, what you visit, what you heard. And therefore we would like to ask you and give you a little bit to challenge. Uh, if you think that the area you love, you visit, you know, can fit to the European wilderness quality standard, please let us know. You can link to this uh, web link and let us know, maybe even send a short descriptions uh, map with a red dot, maybe even some contact details to the people managing or stewardship, wilderness stewardship uh, so stewards and can help to identify the new potential wilderness area for, uh, for, for this European wilderness network. Our donations will help. Okay, and this, uh, as I said, was the first part. Second part, upcoming webinar, is going to surge again for European Business Network part two. We will focus on Ukraine. It will be only visit to the one country, but uh, I am sure you will be surprised how many already, how many audited certified wilderness is already in the network. And we also can provide a little bit of information about the potential of new areas which are still scattered and hidden somewhere in the Carpathian mountains or even farther east in this huge land or huge country in the eastern corner of Europe. It's next week on Monday, 20th of April, three o'clock afternoon. You can, if you like this kind of program, don't forget to click this website and learn a little bit more. More information can be found also here. As you see that there is a number of websites, a lot of activities behind. So if this is something of your interest, 